Uh, God, we have come here to study your word, and uh, God, I pray that you would just illuminate scripture to us. And God, if there's just something, maybe just one thought tonight uh, that we need to ponder, that we need to change or think about, uh, God, I pray that you'd help us with that. God, thank you for your word. Uh, your word is yes, it's amen, and uh, we just thank you that we can come and study your word together. Thank you for the fellowship, uh, even as we started. They're just a buzz in the sanctuary, and God, uh, that is a sign of a healthy church. Uh, so God, just watch over this Bible study. Be with our Awana program. God, I pray for our youth disciple, and uh, Lord, we just look forward to uh, meeting again on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, I want to talk to you tonight about overcoming fear. Overcoming fear. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, and we'll start in verse 22. And let me give you the outline. Uh, number one, understand the importance of prayer. Understand the importance of prayer. If you are going to overcome fear, you need to un uh, understand the importance of prayer. Number two, keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, there's a lot of people that lose their focus, okay? And uh, folks, spiritually, we need to keep our focus and keep our eyes on Jesus. And number three, exercise faith in your daily life. Exercise faith. And I like the word exercise, all right? I don't do a lot of it, <laughs> but I know I need to. Uh, my doctor's saying diet and exercise. Uh, I've got the diet down. I've lost 16 pounds uh, since the second, and uh, I'm going to keep doing that, and I need to exercise more. Uh, and it's physically, physical exercise uh, is good for your health and spiritual exercise is good for your spirit and your Christian walk. You know, after the last several months, or over the last several months, I've heard several people comment something like this. I am so afraid, and then they'll, you, you can just put, I, I mean, a lot, lot of them, it's like, like, our, like our world, uh, like the war, you know, they use the word afraid there. And, uh, th or they say this, this situation really scares me, okay? Or one of my greatest fears is, okay? And, and you don't need to, uh, you know, mistake a, a worry for fear. Those are two different things. I'm not talking about worrying tonight. I'm talking about fearing tonight. And, uh, you know, there's so many phobias. I started to list all the phobias there are. Uh, there's a ton of them. You can look them up on the Internet. Uh, but fear uh, really grips some people, and it's to the point that they can't operate. And sometimes it's to the point uh, that, that they, you know, assume things are, are you know, I, I don't even know how to put it. There, there's things that are going on in their life uh, that, that their perception of it may not be what reality really is. So fear is, uh, is a, a big thing in the life of many people. God and Jesus doesn't want us to live in fear. We know that Satan is the one who brings fear into our lives. And fear, the acronym, false evidence appearing real. Okay, And Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. All right? That's his goal. He wants to steal your peace. Uh, he wants to kill your testimony and destroy, uh, you know, your life. And a lot of times uh, you can see fear in people's lives. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. There's a phrase, and I've said this several times. You know, you, I ask somebody, how, how are you doing? Oh, I'm treading water. <laughs> who, who wants to live treading water? Okay, because even treading water, you can only do that so long, folks. Uh, so we need to understand fear is a real thing in people's lives. We as Christians should not fear anything. Our God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Let's look at this familiar story in Matthew chapter 14. And remember, we all go through storms in life, 
All right? Uh, you know, a lot of times you're either coming out of a storm, going into the storm, or in the middle of a storm. So you can't stop. Uh, I think the next two days we're going to have storm warnings up, okay? And we need to watch those things, but it shouldn't put us in fear. Matter of fact, living in Oklahoma, uh, my grandmother was this way and my mother was this way. If a siren went off in our neighborhood, we went to the college and we went to the basement of the college. Every time. And I got, when I, I told Lori when we got married, I said, if a siren goes off, you, just, you know, you do what you want to do. I'm staying in the house. All right. And, and I'm serious. They lived under the fear of that. And it was a real thing uh, to them. And you have to realize there's two kinds of storms in life. There are storms of correction. All right. I, I didn't get this on the paper, but these are worth writing down. Okay. Storms of correction. That is when God disciplines his children. Some of the storms is because of what we did, okay? We broke a law of God. But the, the second kind of storm is the storms of perfection. Correction and perfection. When God is trying to help us to grow spiritually. I learn more from the storms of life than I do in, in, in smooth water. And we need smooth, smooth water in our lives. I, you know, and, and there are times, and there should be times, that we have peace in our lives. But sometimes God brings these storms into our lives to teach us a spiritual lesson. So let's look at overcoming fear. Number one, understand the importance of prayer. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22, and immediately, well, immediately after what? Uh, Jesus got the news of John beheading earlier in the chapter. And I know that, you know, I know that uh, probably bothered him. And then the, the, the one he's immediately talking about, the feeding of the 5,000. You talk about miracles. You talking about taking, you know, uh, you know, five fish and two loaves of bread and feeding 5,000. And, that, and that's not families, okay? Normally back then they counted men. So the disciples had seen what Jesus had done and performed a, a true miracle, but then Jesus gives them a change of scenery, okay? Because there's, there was something that he needed and wanted to teach them. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples. I love the word made. He didn't say, hey, if you boys want to do this, you do this. He said, no, you guys get in the boat. I'm going to go up, and I'm going to spend some time with my father. You get in the boat, and I'll meet you on the other side. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. Why did he send them away? Folks, you have to understand, when you give yourself away and give yourself away, uh, it's kind of like when the woman, if you remember, with the issue of blood, touched his, touched his, his robe and his clothes, and he knew something had happened because of that, that power that came. He was transferring that power to her. He knew that. And when you give yourself away, you need time to re-energize, to refuel. And Jesus knew that. He was going away. And the other reason was he didn't want people in the multitudes following him thinking, every day I'm going to give you a free meal. Okay, because there were people that followed him because of that and also because of the miracles. The, and, and I'm not saying that's not a, a wrong motive. I'm just saying he wanted to, really, the, the first thing, he wanted to spend time with his heavenly Father. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain, look at this, by himself to pray. Now, folks, I, I love our Saturday night's prayer. We, we meet right down here, those of us. Uh, we have anywhere from 8 to 12 people, and I love that time. But when I go home, when I leave here after prayer for the next three hours, I'm either you know, going over my sermon more time, one more time or I'm in prayer. And, folks, when you're in prayer by yourself, you don't, I mean, we need to listen to other people pray. But I hear God better when it's just me and God. Okay? So Jesus went to refuel. 
Jesus went to commune with his heavenly Father. Jesus uh, went up to the mountain, and now uh, by evening, uh, when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And folks, I like to call it, a, you know, we call this a quiet time. When we have, uh, we read our scripture, and when we meditate on scripture, and when we pray, folks, Jesus had quiet times. So if he has quiet times, we need quiet times. We don't need a radio on. We don't need the TV on. We don't need to be listening to Christian music. We need time alone with God so that we can tune in with him. And, uh, you know, my personal opinion is, you know, it, it, it's like, you know, one, you know, the time before when he, when he uh, was in the boat and, and they all got scared and he calmed the seas. Remember the statement, even the wind obeys his voice. And folks, I believe that if Jesus wanted to, and he may have done this, he spoke the storm into existence to teach his disciples a lesson. Okay? Because God created, God and Jesus created everything, and I'm telling you, everything was subject to God and to Jesus. Jesus had a plan for this storm. Philippians 4. Go with me to Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I know there's storms in life that we are not rejoicing in. But just like, I mean, if... if you know, we get a call right at the end of the service and, and you know, Lori comes in and hollers, uh, our house is on fire. We need to get home. Well, folks, that would be a storm. We would be, you know, displaced for a while and that would be a storm. And, and it's life. That happens. Okay? And I'm not going home sitting in my front yard. <laughs> my house burned down. That's not what it's talking about. It's saying rejoice in everything always because God has got a plan. And you think about even if my house burned down, hey, we got insurance. Guess what we're going to get? We're going to get a new house eventually. And I understand, man, I got Bibles in there that I don't want to lose. Uh, pictures are hard to get back and all that. But we need to understand there are storms in life and how we approach that uh, means a lot. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. For emphasis, he said it again, let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Now here it is, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything, he says, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Folks, God wants us praying about everything, everything. You say, you know, where's the line drawn? Folks, again, you know, praying about where you go out and eat lunch, you know, I'm not saying you have to do that. But any need in life, any, any where, where we need to make choices and where we want God's wisdom in our life, where we know uh, when to go and when to wait, where we know, he's just saying, in the spiritual world in which God and Jesus lives, prayer is our lifeline as Christians. And we need to be men and women of prayer. And the peace of God, there you go, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Folks, you can find the peace of God when you are praying. See, when you're praying, you're focused on God and you're focused on prayer. But when you're looking at situations in life and you're looking in storms in life, and here's what I've told people, do not say this. What else could happen? Don't say it, all right? Because there's more that could happen. Man, spend time with God. Spend time in prayer. Commune with God. Have his word handy there. And it says, well, guard your hearts and minds well, I, I don't want to skip surpasses all understandings. Lost people do not understand prayer, okay? 
But you know what I've noticed? The lost man will ask me to pray for somebody. Okay, folks, it happens to me all the time. Would you, I, I, I mean, I could be at a hospital. I could be places and I get a phone call. Hey, Mike, I, I need you to pray for. And man, I, folks, every request that somebody says to me, I write it down and I make it a thing of prayer. And I'm not trying to tell you how spiritual I am. I'm saying we have the peace of God in our lives and the lost people don't because they don't spend time in prayer. They're not communing with God. And folks, Jesus is called the what? Prince of Peace. So if you want to understand and overcome fear in your life, you need to understand how important prayer is. Folks, if it was important to Jesus, it needs to be important to us also. The peace that passes all understand, guard your hearts and minds. What is it saying? Guess who's trying to mess with your mind? You know who it is. It's Satan. He puts thoughts in your head, they're wrong. He makes, he wants you to think right is wrong and wrong is right. He wants to think your deal, you're the only one going through this, and this is the worst one that's ever been in life, period. He gets these thoughts in your head to where is, you know, when you're praying, when you're communing with God, I'm telling you, Satan, he don't like that. Just say Jesus' name about four or five times in a row, and he'll leave you alone. Okay, so prayer. Understand the importance of prayer. Number two, keep your eyes on Jesus. Look at verse 25. And the fourth watch of the night, basically in the middle of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. All right? Now, he could have walked around the shore. But again, he, he had a purpose in them walking on the sea. They saw him feed, feed uh, 5,000, which is a great miracle. But what are, in life, in logic, what is the chance of a man walking on water right in the middle of the sea? There is zero chance. Zero. But that's what Jesus did. Why? Because he was trying to show them the power that God had given him. The power that he had. Folks, there is power in prayer. There's power in prayer. And it says, uh, then, and, and when his disciples saw him on the sea, they were troubled. Another one says they were afraid. Another uh, translation there. Saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Why did they think it was a ghost? Here's one thing I think. They weren't looking for Jesus. Think about that. Your mind plays tricks on you, plays tricks on you. I, I know when we were young, uh, my bedroom faces the south of the house, and there was times we would just, dad would uh, open the, you know, the, would open the windows, and that's the way we cooled off at night. And I remember one night, I was laying there, and the, you know how curtains are, mom always had curtains, and I'm laying there, and something, the, the curtains blew, a south wind blew, and blew the curtains on me, you talk about almost coming out of the bed. You talk about, you know, I'm swinging, I'm, I'm ready. To, what is that? I had fear in my life because this is not supposed to happen in the middle of the night. Okay, it startled me. And I know fear is real, folks, but we don't have to be afraid. I, I, I'm telling you, when I was young, I was afraid of the dark. I really was. I hated it when my mom said, hey, after, after supper, when it was dark, and here's what she gave me. She gave me a quarter, and, a, and a, a block down the road was a grocery store. Go get a loaf of bread. I could do it for a quarter. And you know what I'd do? I'd walk out of my house just like I was something. And when my feet hit the street, I'd run one block. I'd run all the way down there. Why? Because I'd hear, hur, hur, hur. you know, I'm thinking a dog's getting me or something like that. And folks, fear plays with your mind. It really does. And they thought. They saw a ghost, and they cried out for fear, cried out, okay, scared. But immediately, I love that word, Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. Can you get this in your mind? These disciples in the boat, and they're just shaking and scared and looking at all around, and Jesus has said, hey, all right, be of good cheer. Don't worry, be happy. All right? And he says, it is I. It is I. Do not be 
afraid. Folks, that's a command from Jesus. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And again, we kind of, and I know I do, I, I get on Peter because he is very, very impulsive. A lot of times his mouth engaged before his brain engaged. But I want to commend him here because he was the first one. He saw Jesus walking on the water, so the fear had to go away from him quicker or sooner. And he just thought, now that's a cool deal there. That is a cool thing. And, and it says, so he said, come. Now again, logic says when you put your foot over the boat and you step in the water, you, you'll go straight down. But what did, what did uh, uh, Peter show there? He showed faith. Folks, we sometimes have to get out of the safety boat Get out of the boat and show faith. And here's, here's, here's a word. We start sentences with this, with this word, and I, I really don't like it at all as Christians. I can't, and you just fill in the blank. What does the Bible say about can't? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, how cool is that? Who did it? Peter and his faith? Well, it helped. But no, Jesus and God made that happen, folks. Jesus and God. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, at first he saw Jesus and he said, that's cool. If Jesus is doing that, I want to do that. Jesus let him get out. Jesus made sure at first things were fine. And once he got out away from the boat, he started looking around. He saw the lightning flashes. He saw the wind blowing. He took his eyes off of Jesus, and he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Folks, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be times in our lives where we feel like we are sinking there's going to be times in our life where we feel like there's no solution to our problems. Folks, I believe with all my heart, God has a solution to every problem you have in life. There's not a problem God can't solve. And what we do, I mean, you know, sometimes we try to fix everything ourselves. God doesn't get involved because you think you are doing you know, uh, right by what you were doing. You think that, man, I can fix this. Folks, we can't fix everyone's problems. We, we can't fix everything in life. I hear this every week of my life in some way. One word. And it doesn't scare me because I've experienced it. It's just that when people hear the word cancer, it's like all hope is gone. And I've got a theory about cancer. Once you have it, and I understand they'll say you're in remission and you're all that, and I'm not even saying, I mean, I may die of cancer and I understand that. But I'm telling you, I will not fear cancer. I will not fear the results from cancer. Will I take chemo? Probably not, but that is a personal choice. I will serve the Lord as long as I can walk up these stairs. All right, I'm going to have victory over cancer because even if I die of cancer, to be absent from the body, folks, is to be present with the Lord. We can overcome anything with God's help. Peter was afraid. Peter began to sink, but he knew the words to say, Lord, Master, Savior, save me. Folks, you did that when you got saved. When you literally asked Christ to come into your life, that's exactly what you were sinking deep in sin. What is the song? Far from the peaceful shore. All right? And God saved you. Well, folks, he's not going to not save you. I mean, you know, you don't lose your salvation. 
And God can do anything. We must understand Peter, when he got to look and, and he realized how calm Jesus was and he wasn't sinking, he realized he did something wrong. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And see, where Satan wants to keep our eyes is on our problems. Satan wants us to do that. And when you keep your eyes on your problems, you are going to sink, okay? And even when I think about sinking, I, I know Christians that sink into depression, folks. Fear causes depression. Fear causes you to think, you know, things are worse than, than it is. Fear does crazy things in your life and in your mind. But God will save you, folks. God's not going to let you go. God's not going to let you drown. God's not going to let you run out of money. You, you just plug in anything you want. Talked to a man not too long ago. He asked me to come by his house. And his biggest fear is that he's going to run out of the money before he dies. And I just said, I told this guy, listen, you've got to depend on God. It's not, you know, you know how much money you have in the bank. God, why? Because his word says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Now, you may not have everything you want, but folks, there's a huge difference between wants and needs. Okay? There is. Look at Psalm 27. Go with me. Psalm 27. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The answer is nobody. I'm not afraid of anybody. I shouldn't be afraid of anybody. All right? And I know people think I'm joking when I say this, but if somebody told me and brought a, brought a gun and stuck it in my chest or face and said, you get down on your, your knees and you deny Christ, I, my answer would be pull the trigger. That's not happening. Okay? I will not deny. I mean it, folks. I don't care who you are. I don't care how, how you threaten me. It's not happening. Okay? The Lord is, because even at that, I know, you know, people just say, well, you know, you wouldn't be our preacher. You wouldn't be around anymore. Hey, folks, that's life, okay? All right? It's life. I, I'm, I'm not always going to be your preacher. I'm not saying I'm going anywhere. I'm just saying a guy can only live so long and a guy can only preach so long. Somebody's got to follow me. Let me say it like that, okay? Somebody's got to come up when I die or God tells me to go. Somebody's got to follow me. The Lord is my strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? I can tell you the Notice the rhetorical questions. Nobody, nothing. I'm not afraid. When the wicked came up against me to eat my flesh, Satan, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army mate encamp against me. I remember Elijah. <laughs> Servant comes out of the tent and he goes, oh man, what do we do? He looked at him and said, uh, Kimo Saba, I ain't worried about this. <laughs> Why? Because you're not seeing what I'm seeing. I'm seeing angels behind those chariots that are waiting on us. I, I'm seeing, I see an army of folks. We have the King of Kings and we have the Lord of Lords. My heart shall not fear. There's three times it tells us not to fear. Though war may rise against me, this I will be confident. One thing I've desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It doesn't mean every time you get scared, you run to the church. Because you think about, where, does, where, where can worship take place? Wherever you are. But I, I do recommend what's that song run to the father you know anybody remember know that song oh that's a good uh, hey run to the father run to the father to behold the beauty of the lord to inquire in his temple for in the time of trouble he's saying trouble's gonna come nobody's immune to trouble nobody he shall hide me in his pavilion what are pavilions it keeps the hell off of your head keeps the sun off of you. Pavilion, it covers you. It covers you in the secret place of his tabernacle. Now's what he's talking about. He's not literally saying go to church there. His presence should calm you, okay? 
Folks, I don't know about you, but when I wake up on Sunday morning, I can't wait to get to church. I just, I, I can't wait. Sunday's a, my favorite day of the week. To have 500 people in here all singing praises to God and to feel the Holy Spirit in this place. What do we have to be afraid of? He shall hide me and he shall set me upon a rock. Number three, understand the importance of prayer. Keep your eyes on Jesus and exercise faith in your daily life. And if you start an exercise program, you don't just walk into a gym and say, you know what, I think I'll bench press 200 pounds right now. Well, it ain't going to happen. I'm going to start with 20, <laughs> all right? I haven't lifted weights since college, all right? I couldn't lift. I mean, I could lift 20. I'm si simply saying you don't start out with 200 pounds. You start out with 20, and you do reps. And, and we, we lifted three days a week, and each time we would put on five or ten more pounds. Whereas by the end of two months, I was lifting 200 pounds. My son right now, he bench presses 325 pounds. Folks, don't mess with Jonathan. I'm just telling you. I don't mess with him. But he didn't get that way. He didn't wake up. When he was in high school, as a sophomore playing basketball for Alma, he was always the littlest. His, 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 his legs were just skinny. And those seniors would just push him around, push him around. But the guy had a good shot against Ozark. He scored 26 points his second game starting as a sophomore. Okay? And all I'm trying to say is, you, you have to exercise faith in your life. Folks, we exercise faith every day. If you ate out today, you exercise faith. You don't know where the food come. You don't know who cooked it. And you, didn't know, you don't know if they dropped it on the floor or not. All right? That's faith. And that's just food. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about storms of life. Okay? God cares. God cares about you. Faith. Now look, look at verse 31. And immediately he stretched out his hands and caught him. And look what he said. Oh, you of little faith. Folks, how many times just with the disciples say, where's your faith? Why are you doubting me? Why are you worried about this? Why are you stressed? Why can't you sleep at night? Why do you think? And I'll tell you another thing. When I was little, I'd go to my grandmother's in Binger, Oklahoma, and I had an uncle that was, he was funny. His name was Cookie. That wasn't his name. It was Cruz. But that dude was so funny. He was one of the, you know, to have one of them funny uncles. I don't know if everybody has one, but I was so blessed by that. But, you know, one time he came, and it was already dark, and I was sitting in uh, the spare bedroom where I stayed with my and, and Cookie came in and goes, he goes, you better watch out tonight. And I said, what? And he went and pulled up the bed and looked under the covers. That, no, the boogeyman ain't here right now. And you know that night, I sat up all night just waiting for the boogeyman. I didn't even know what the boogeyman was. And folks, that's what I'm saying. Satan will bluff you. Satan, he'll, he'll just mess with you. All right, he'll mess with you. Why? Why did you doubt? And when you got into the boat, the wind ceased. Folks, I'm telling you, I'd rather be in the boat with Jesus than out of the boat without him. Man, wherever, either in or out, man, if you've got Jesus, you've got everything. And those who are in the boat came and worshiped him. Why are you worshiping? How do we worship God? We do it by faith. See, the world wants to say, well, I've never seen God. Well, I haven't either, but I've seen him at work, folks. I've seen him at work. Worship him saying, truly you are the son of God. See, fear shows a lack of faith. Fear shows a lack of faith. 2 Timothy 1.7 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Okay, it's not from God, it's from Satan, but of power. That's Holy Spirit power, 
of love and a sound mind. Satan wants to mess with your head. Don't let him get in your head. Don't let him lie to you. Don't believe his lies. John 8, says he's the father of lies. He loves to lie. He always wants to tell you you can't or it won't work. He always give you, gives you the bad news of every situation. That is Satan. Fear not, Jesus said. See, folks, Jesus controls everything. He controls the winds and he controls the waves. Mark 9, and we're finished. Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 17. And one of the crowd answered and said, and, and remember, uh, Jesus gave the disciples power, okay? He gave them power, that Holy Spirit power uh, for, for healing. You know, Peter and John went to, the, went to the temple and he said, you know, silver and gold have I none, but in the name of Jesus Christ. And it says, teacher, I brought you, I brought you my, uh, one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought uh, you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, if he throws himself down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples, and they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed and fell to the ground and waddled, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And he often has thrown uh, him into both the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help. Jesus said unto him, if you believe. Faith, trust, believe in God. All things are possible to him who believes. And the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Now go to verse 29. I just remembered this. It's not on the sheet or anything. But he said to them, This, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. He answered the man's question, why couldn't the disciples do it? And I don't even have time to go into to fasting, but we've already talked about prayer. But fasting is not for losing weight, folks. Fasting is not eating and totally concentrating on things that God puts in your heart. And there can be all kinds of I mean, there's short-term fasting, there's medium fasting, there's long-term fasting. But it simply means it's, it's faith, it is prayer, and the hard stuff, the tough stuff, man, you're going to have to do some fasting. And there's all kinds of books out there on fasting. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for this night, and God, I thank you for these stories. This truly is one of my favorite stories in the Word of God. And God, I just, I know there are a lot of people that live with fear. And God, I pray that somehow that they would learn to just fall into your arms. And when they got into bed, that, or they would pray and pray, and God, you would give them that peace that passes all understanding. God, prayer is such an important part. We really need to replace uh, a worry with prayer. And God, I pray that we would keep our eyes on Jesus. doesn't matter what's going on in life. doesn't matter how bad someone says it is. Even with doctors, uh, doctors don't give and take lives. God, I pray that we would pray in faith. And God, I pray we would pray about everything. I pray that we'd give all of our cares and all of our burdens to you. God, help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. And Lord, help us to exercise faith. I know you will never let us down. I know that, God, and I believe that. And I believe that's what they was, Jesus was trying to tell his disciples. You have to believe. Don't doubt it. You can do all things through Christ. So God, I pray that as we go through this thing called life, that we would be testimonies of faith. 
that we, even in tense situations, will not fear. God, people watch us. People listen to what we say. And God, I pray that we would have the confidence that you are with us. You never leave us and you never forsake us. God, I pray that that would be true in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.